and Courbet's self-portrait as the focal point. If we are to avoid the historical errors of reading in, one of our tasks is to reconstruct the conditions in which this painting was produced, and thus to identify those characteristics of the work which Courbet and his audience would have regarded as giving the painting a social, cultural and artistic meaning. One of the first questions which will unearth evidence on which we can base a well-informed explanation is how was the painting made and why? To make a painting of this size, seven pieces of canvas were stitched together and stretched over a wooden framework called a stretcher to meet Courbet's requirements. Why should he want to make such a big painting? Normally, paintings of this size and scale were designed to stand out in the official exhibition, the Salon of the French Royal Academy. They were generally termed history paintings, and their subjects were almost always religious, mythological, literary or historical. Such paintings were traditionally prestigious demonstrations of artistic competence and professionalism, the most successful of which were accorded approval in the form of state purchase. A typical history painting by a relatively progressive artist is this one by Delacroix, called The Death of Sardanapalus, which he exhibited in the Salon of 1827. Like Courbet's painting, its sheer size required it to be made from several pieces of canvas stitched together. But unlike the painter's studio, Delacroix's subject is taken from a literary source, a play written by Lord Byron in 1821. The play is based on the debauched life of Sardanapalus, a king of Assyria in the 7th century BC. Delacroix's scene represents the king's imminent defeat while his slaves, concubines and horses are slaughtered before his suicide. Courbet's painting evokes in its scale the conventions of salon history painting, but his choice of subject matter was not typical for this type of salon set piece. So, what is its subject? Is the theme literary? The subject, the painter's studio, was a well-established genre, though not normally for large-scale pictures. Why was Courbet elevating an important but academically marginal genre to the scale of an impressive history painting? One way to find out is to look for contemporary source material. An important document is the letter Courbet wrote while still working on the picture in the autumn of 1854. It was addressed to his friend and supporter, Jean Fleury. Courbet says that his painting represents the moral and physical history of his studio, divided into two parts, one on either side of his self-portrait. We learn more from other extracts. On the left is the other world of commonplace life, the masses, destitution, poverty, wealth, the exploited, the exploiters, people who live on death. At the edge of the canvas, there is a Jew whom I saw in England making his way through the feverish activity of London streets. He was reverently carrying a casket on his right arm, covering it with his left hand, and seemed to be saying, it's me who has got the best of it. Behind him is a curé with a coarse red face and a triumphant expression. In front of them is a poor weather-beaten old man, a Republican veteran of 1793, that Minister of the Interior, for instance, who was in the Assembly when Louis XVI was condemned to death. Then there is a huntsman, a reaper, a professional strongman, a clown, a peddler of old military braided clothes, a labourer's wife, a labourer, an undertaker's mute, a skull on a newspaper, an Irish woman suckling a child, and a mannequin. The peddler of old clothes presides over all this displaying his frippery to these people, all of whom pay the greatest attention, each in their own way. Then comes the canvas on my easel and myself painting in a Syrian profile. Behind my chair is a nude female model. She's leaning on the chair back as she watches me paint for a moment. After this woman comes Promayé with his violin under his arm, as in the portrait he sent me. Then Brias, Queno, Bouchon, and Proudhon. Apart from Proudhon, the socialist philosopher, Courbet had already painted portraits of these friends he mentions. This portrait from 1848 is of Alphonse Promayet, who had grown up with Courbet in Ornans. 
And this is a portrait of Alfred Brias, an art collector and patron of Courbet. Painted in 1854, Courbet quoted it in his studio. So too is this portrait from the same year of Jean Fleury, the recipient of Courbet's letter. Novelist and critic, Jean Fleury made himself the theorist of realism in art. His importance for Courbet is signified by his prominent position in the studio. Again, Courbet can be seen to be quoting an earlier portrait, this time one from around 1847, of the poet and critic Charles Baudelaire, with whom Courbet had a friendship complicated not least by the poet's intellectual opposition to realism. Courbet was using previous portraits as raw material to be, as it were, reassembled within a larger work. He does not tell us this in the letter, nor is his description always consistent with the finished work. For instance, he says, The painting I am working on is one of a donkey driver who pinches the bottom of a girl he meets, and of donkeys laden with sacks, all in a landscape with a windmill. This would have been seen as a typical Courbet image, but in the final painting he settled for a less contentious image which does not distract attention from the rest of the painting. At first, a letter by the artist may seem to be an authoritative explanation, but we should be wary of taking Courbet's letter at face value. We need to check it against the painting, against other bits of information, against a deeper knowledge of the context in which the letter was written. Courbet even hints at an additional underlying meaning in the painting. You'll have to make it out as best you can. People who want to judge the picture will have some work to do. They'll just have to do it the best they can. And in a letter to his friend Francais, written by early 1855, he wrote, Perhaps you'd like to know the subject of my painting. It would take so long to explain that I'd prefer to leave you to guess when you see it. It's a history of my studio, morally and physically. It's fairly mysterious. Interpret it, he who can. At this time, there was strong censorship of any overt anti-government material, particularly that which attacked Emperor Napoleon III and his family. It is likely that Courbet's letter was designed for limited circulation. His description of social types would satisfy the literal-minded, whilst also suggesting to those in the know that the painting had a deeper meaning. This view seems plausible in the light of Courbet's own full title for the painting, The Painter's Studio, real allegory defining a period of seven years of my artistic life. Allegory is traditionally used as a kind of continuous and systematic metaphor in which depicted objects or figures and their interrelations present a clear and literal meaning. But at the same time, these depictions also have other, less explicit meanings. As Courbet wrote, make it out as best you can, and it's fairly mysterious, interpret it he who can. On one level, we could read this picture as a collection of social types. That is the depiction of socially specific people from contemporary society. The censor would have expected this from Courbet as the notorious realist, materialist and socialist artist. However, Courbet intended his painting to be interpreted as a real allegory, to be read as a systematic and detailed metaphor which expressed a comment on what he regarded as the contemporary world which he said defined seven years of his artistic life. Courbet planned to exhibit the studio and other works at Napoleon III's showpiece of the Second Empire, the Universal Exposition of 1855. When the studio and the burial at Ornan were rejected by the jury of the fine arts section, Courbet decided to arrange his own one-man show. What then was the real allegory? What was its purpose? How was it understood? Little is known of the official attitude, and critics did not write directly about the allegory. This might be because they were afraid to breach the censor's laws, or because they found it too difficult to work out. We can reconstruct what Courbet might have intended by looking at an explanation partly based on recent well-conducted research for a section of the catalogue for the major Courbet exhibition held in 1978. 
The whole allegory should be split into two parts, as Corbet himself hinted at. Corbet's central position signifies that all these characters are determinants on his artistic practice. And we know that Corbet saw political, social and artistic factors as determining his artistic life. The left-hand side of the painting should be read as a social and political allegory. The key to this half is the seated figure with the dogs. As we can see from this painting by Yvonne of Napoleon III in 1863, Courbet's seated figure bears a striking resemblance to the emperor. Critics from the start referred to this figure as a braconnier, which at the time had three possible meanings. A man who trains hunting dogs, the usual meaning of poacher, and a slang for a gay dog or bon viveur. Napoleon III was well known as a libertine and a dog lover, and as one who, in Corbet's opinion as well as others, had, as it were, poached or bagged the Republic for his own ends. With many journalists and cartoonists finding themselves in prison for expressions of opinions that hinted at les majesty, symbols were used as indirect references. The symbol for Napoleon III became the jackboot, hence the pair of thigh boots worn by the impeccably dressed braconnier. If we accept that this figure represents Napoleon III, the meaning of the rest of the figures falls into place. It is suggested that the figure on the extreme left is a thinly disguised portrait of the Jewish banker Achille Fould. Fould was Napoleon's Minister of Finance from 1849 to 1852 and Minister of State from 1852 to 1860. He helped finance Louis Napoleon's campaign for election to the presidency. His casket and Corbet's London description could refer to the financial support that Napoleon enjoyed from English sources. Fould, who was also the organiser of the Universal Exposition in 1855, was a conservative in his support for the fine arts and without any sympathy for the artistic manifestations of realism. Next to him, we can identify Courbet's curé as Louis Vuo, photographed here by Nadar. A right-wing Catholic journalist, his attitude to Napoleon's despotism is best pinned down by the exiled Victor Hugo, writing in 1852 on the French press. They write in fetters and chains. Independence is gagged, talent is kept under close arrest, honesty is spied on, and Vio keeps shouting, I am free. The Republican can be identified from Corbet's more specific information in the letter as Lazare Carnot, who had a chequered career after the French Revolution. For Corbet, he represented the variable loyalty of all opportunist Republicans. He shows this by means of a visual pun. As a member of the Directoire Exécutif in his Republican days of 1796, he wore an ornate hat with the front turned up. Courbet shows him with a similar shaped but less splendid hat turned round. In effect, Carnot is shown as a turncoat. The social and political allegory continues with the related group being shown the wares of the peddler of old military braided clothes. He can be identified as Persigny, who was nicknamed the hawker of Napoleonic ideas. A former hussar, he was one of the chief agents of Louis Napoleon's coup d'etat of 1851 and subsequently his Minister of Interior. This representative of Napoleon III's France displays what Courbet calls his frippery to figures who can be identified as representing client states or potential clients of France. The clown is referred to by Courbet in his letter as a cue rouge. That is a clown whose costume included a long pigtail as worn by the Chinese. It has been suggested that he represents China where in 1849 France acquired a concession in Shanghai. The strong man leaning over the clown's shoulder represents Turkey. In 1855, France and Britain were Turkey's allies fighting Russia in the Crimean War. The huntsman bears a strong resemblance to Garibaldi. He can be seen to represent Italy's struggle for unification, which was politically supported by France. The figure wears the red striped scarf of the Garibaldini, in a similar vein, this man next to him, whom Courbet omits to mention in his letter, could represent Hungary 
in its fight for independence from Austria. The man next to him, holding the scythe, then a symbol of Polish liberation, represents Poland and its struggle for independence from Russia. Other suggested identifications include the undertaker's mute, dressed in black, whose pose is reminiscent of Ang's portrait of Monsieur Bertin. Bertin was the editor of a well-known newspaper, a copy of which is on his left-hand side, weighted by a skull, the traditional symbol of death. This may allude to Proudhon's remark that the press was the cemetery of ideas, or, as Hugo suggested, so enslaved as to be ineffective. On the right-hand side, as on the left, a seated figure gives us a clue to the allegory represented. As we have seen, it is a portrait of Jean Fleury, advocate of realism in art and literature. This side, according to Courbet's letter, contains the shareholders, that is to say friends, workers, art lovers. It is stocked full of the people who sustain and support Courbet's vision of himself as the realist artist. In fact, in the centre of the painting, Courbet is depicted as working on a realist landscape. The depiction captures the material reality of the rural scene so well that it entrances the untutored peasant child. And to emphasise his realism, Courbet depicts in full light a semi-naked female model, consistent with his own previous representations of women as more class-specific than the smooth, universal nudes of academic painting. The figure is also evocative of recently published photographs of nudes. Photography offered what Courbet saw as a new science of objective recording. And to strengthen his point, Courbet contrasts the female model with the mannequin in the shadows behind his realist painting. A mannequin was often used in conventional academic practice for figure painting. The contrast between the fully lit female model, one of Courbet's realist subjects, and the dimly lit academic mannequin informs our reading of the systematic organisation of the whole painting. If we accept the identification of the figures, we can work out the two halves of a complex social, political and artistic allegory. The left-hand side is dominated by an impeccably dressed braconnier, the Republican who secured power by means of a coup d'etat. The other figures, who each appear as social types, also individually represent the social and political characters of Louis Napoleon's sham republic. As Courbet called them, the exploited, the exploiters. These figures are assembled so as to imply a critique of the social, moral and political determinants on Courbet's art practice. By contrast, the right-hand side, full of recognisable portraits, some based on the artist's own paintings, represent Courbet's intimate social world, his friends, his patrons, the intellectuals who sustain his particular positivist and materialist aesthetic. The two halves together can be seen to be a statement on what Courbet regarded as the major determinants on his art practice, those which defined his artistic life since 1848. Yet his statement is not clear-cut, for there is contradiction in his representation. His struggle to combine an allegiance to realism whilst using the traditional device of allegory, and more particularly his portrayal of Jean Fleury, Proudhon and Baudelaire was to evoke conflicting aesthetic and social doctrines. To be interested in reconstructing why Courbet produced this enormous painting, in interpreting his allegory and in explaining why contemporary critics avoided discussing its complex meanings, is to regard the painter's studio as the product of particular and often contradictory social and cultural conditions. Given such an interest, an explanation of the picture as essentially an expression of the modern artist's concern with making art itself the subject of major progressive painting, is to exclude reference to the very determinants that Courbet saw as defining his art practice and which he tried to represent in his real allegory.